MLS players, they would strike and we would have the league, right? Uh, so it's one of the things that we have to either fewer matches in tournaments or matches of shorter duration. But if I am at a tournament as the coach, I have to consider my next training session is this regeneration session. So I have to consider the intensity of matches. And the tournament is just the most obvious one. Sometimes that happens in league matches. It's a very demanding league match because it's a good matchup. I have to consider this too. Then the duration of training sessions and matches. Some of this is uh, uh, um, the length of a training session. Some of it is a little bit back to frequency, which is the number of training sessions, but within that, the duration. So a lot of coaches uh, come with a mindset of, well, if an hour is good, two hours must be better. But there comes a point where if you're so fatigued, you don't learn anything new. Uh, soccer is one of those sports that you need to train in a, very, a manner very similar to the way the game is played. And the way the game is played is with these intermittent bursts of heavy activity with a little bit of light activity in between. You don't sprint for 90 minutes in a match. No human being can sprint for 90 minutes nonstop. Right? It's a little burst and then walking, jogging, and all of that. Well, my training session has to replicate a little bit of that rhythm of a match itself. Uh, so if I do that and I go for 60 minutes, that probably is more than enough, let's say, for U10, U12, maybe even sometimes the U14s. Uh, so we have to be careful about even at U19, we're probably a nine minute training session, not two hours. So we have to think about the duration. And one of the things that impacts, therefore, the duration and why some coaches want to go in you know, these two hour blocks and whatnot is because they're actually running an inefficient training session. That inefficient training session has too much downtime in it. Uh, it, it is laced with more drills than activities where there's lots of standing around and waiting to do things. So over two hours you actually don't get exhausted, but the learning isn't very good because the mental concentration, the mental focus dissipates with children uh, too quickly, that kind of a block uh, approach. Right? One of the things that we know from studies done in physical education is that you learn a sport better, your performance in a sport better, by doing a lot of short training sessions rather than a lot of uh, a few long block training sessions. Uh, so it would be better to increase perhaps the frequency of training session, maybe two or three training sessions per match, than to increase the duration of the training sessions. And then the same thing is true of the matches. What are the, what's the duration of the matches and tournaments? And we just really talked about that a little bit, right? So thinking about my scheduling for my seasonal plan, here's one of the things that we try to get across to coaches at, at every level and every age, is that you put together your seasonal plan for the development of your kids, beginning with the last day of the season, and work backwards to the first day of the season. And most coaches do it the other way around. But let's say I'm working with the under 17s. And I'm thinking I'm, in, I'm with the under 17s in first division. I'm just saying first, second, third division because the, the labels that we give about varies across the country, but everybody kind of understands first, second, third, fourth division, this kind of stuff. So I'm in first division, and I don't want under 17s, I want to end up in the final of the national championships. Well, I got a schedule from that day the end of July, which is when that occurs, backwards, right, into the beginning of the soccer year. And one of the steps I'm going to take along the way to do the best I can to help us have a shot at ending up in that final match, that final day, okay? One of the things I do just before that, regionals, state cup, league play, mid-season, winter break, pre-season, et cetera, et cetera. I'm working my way all the way back, so I've got this stair-step approach up towards ending up perhaps in that. If I'm coaching the under eights, it's my final thing of the season. It's not the national championships. Maybe it's the under eight jamboree and picnic, right? Combo, kind of a thing going on. And I'm working, what am I doing to get my little tights up to that, that point in the year, okay? And working backwards. So go from backwards back to opening day. These are the general categories, preseason phase, midseason phase. Then if I'm old enough in the age group and a level of play, then I might be getting the state, regionals, national type competition, you know, and what am I doing in all of that? So 
some ideas here. This is not exhaustive at all. These are just samplings for us to understand what are some of the things that I'm thinking about in my training session focus. And again, this is going to vary according to age groups. If I'm doing one training session out of four that's purely a fitness training session, that's much more appropriate to adolescent players. Adolescence in the biological stage of growth generally ranges from age 15 to 23. It's when the body physiologically is going through adolescence. Okay? Having been a former college coach, I can absolutely say that college players are still adolescents. At least my guys were. Okay? And I got that phone call from the police department at 2 o'clock, you know, that sort of a deal, dealing with 21-year-olds. Okay? Yeah, you're still acting like an adolescent there, pal. All right? But I'm not doing one out of four training sessions on just fitness approach with under eights. Okay? I'm playing games that impact their fitness. So it's in a different context as to the fitness type of uh, training and approach that I take. Okay? And therefore the frequency of it. If I'm dealing with those adolescent players, 15 and older, strength is a part of it. If I'm dealing with under sixes, balance is a much, much more important piece of their uh, fitness uh, development. Playing metrics has a place really only with adolescents because it's not until physiologically that my body will uh, uh, respond to that type of training. Okay? Uh, rhythmic exercises can begin at under six. This is balance. This is how to move my limb across the midline of the body. Uh, this is getting some more fluid movement and control of my limbs. And if I have that, then eventually I'm more skillful with the ball. If I have more control of my body, I have more control of the ball as a consequence. Tumbling, right? I put in there because this I think we need it under 6, under 8, under 10, probably under 12. Here's where I'm going with that one. Because not all of us are going to be qualified to teach tumbling. We may have to learn it ourselves or uh, bring someone in who knows how to do that. But here's the point. Physical education in our school systems has either disappeared or is greatly reduced in most of our school systems. And in many cases, if they do have physical education, it boils down to walk around the track a couple of times and then go to your next class. It's not physical education in the sense that I had, uh, certainly where I had, 45 minute to an hour physical education, education class five days a week when I was in elementary school where we learned how to do somersaults, board rolls, you know, play games, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So when I got older and I was either playing football or soccer or whatever and I got hit, I knew how to do a tuck and roll and come right back up onto my feet and not just go <clears throat> and injure myself, okay? Uh, so. It's that now our private sports clubs have become, need to become the physical education teachers, particularly with our U12 players. So this is a factor for not only the player development curriculum, but also for the board of directors to understand. What are the services that we're providing to our membership? And if because things like physical education are beginning to disappear or be greatly reduced in our school system, how do we find some of the expertise to come into our club? How do we find a wherewithal to do that, that we can take on a little bit of that role? That we can do some of that because it does impact their soccer development, right? Uh, so just an example. Uh, one out of two training sessions being technical, but you know, if we follow a lot of what we're talking about in terms of activities as opposed to drills, you're going to be doing technical and tactical things at the same time. It's just where's the focus of the coach and what I'm emphasizing in that training session. Same thing here, one out of two training sessions being tactical in nature, that becomes more and more of a factor as I get into the older players. Regeneration we talked about uh, after a vigorous match or a, a heavy weekend tournament. Goalkeeper, excuse me, goalkeeper training. I've been through the U.S. soccer offers a, a national goalkeeper license. And I've been through that course myself, and one of the lead instructors is uh, Peter Meller. If you don't know him, he's a renowned in goalkeeper uh, uh, coaching, and uh, is a friend of mine for many years. And one of the things he talks about there is to not get into specialized goalkeeper training until you're 14. That prior to that, we get as many kids exposed to goalkeeper the position of goalkeeper as possible, and that even from youth 14 on, when they begin to get some specialized goalkeeper training, 
And not that you have to exclude the kids from that prior, it's just that they shouldn't be pigeonholed into that prior. But he says, one of the things that was impacting, negatively impacting, the development of the American goalkeeper now is the goalkeeper spend too much time just with the goalkeeper coach. They need to spend more time with the team so that they can develop tactically. Because there's no point that they know all of the skills of technique of, of goalkeeping if they don't know the tactics of goalkeeping. Well, the tactics of goalkeeping is reading the other team's attack coming at you, organizing your defense to deal with that attack coming at you. How to organize my team when we're defending against a corner kick, a free kick, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to have our goalkeepers training with the team more often. And perhaps the goalkeeper coach coming and observing that and giving some pointers to the goalkeepers during team training. So this is part of what we're getting across in, in goalkeeping. Then, you know, uh, team building activities can be things that occur during training sessions and away sometimes uh, from the training session. It could be the little under tens going to a pizza party after a match. It could be the under 17s going, you know, rafting or, or uh, you know, on a ropes course or something uh, that bonds them a little bit. So it's just thinking what's possible there that impacts the kids. With the older